Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, let me hit the solar news. And actually, before we started recording, we were into some discussion. So I want to keep those things going here in just a second. But um, in solar news this week, uh, there was a, an appeal to the Commerce Department by uh, an in installation or a solar manufacturer to investigate the anti dumping countervailing duties claims. Uh, what this is, they call it AD slash CV, is basically China to avoid tariffs has shifted manufacturing to Vietnam, uh, Thailand, and, um, and Malaysia. And so these companies are saying, hey, all you're doing is just moving your operations to avoid the tariffs. So let's impose tariffs on these things as well. The domestic market, uh, other solar manufacturers and everybody else is kind of saying, don't, don't kick this hornet's nest because that's 80% of all of our supply and we're already having trouble enough getting our supply. So, uh, but the Commerce Department agreed that they will begin an investigation of that anti-dumping against those uh, solar panels. And, um, and they're talking about perhaps imposing a 250% tariff penalty, uh, but nothing's expected to come of this until January of 2023. So government wheels move slowly. Green Mountain Power, which is a Vermont uh, utility, is gonna start leasing um, end-phase battery systems, which is interesting. They're looking at doing a virtual power plant kind of program. And so they're saying, okay, we will lease to you. And they're saying up to two of the IQ battery, uh, the IQ 10s, which are 10 kilowatts. So that would be a 20 kilowatt hour backup system for $65 a month for 10 years to their customers, which seems a pretty good deal. Um, if you already have your batteries, you can join into this program as well, and they will pay you some upfront money. Uh, the number in the article was mentioned at $9,500 for four of these units. So, um, so it, it's just that they're trying to create essentially a virtual power plant and they're starting to give some folks some of these units. So that's an interesting approach. Uh, so speaking of batteries, Sunvolt Storage uh, announced that they were increasing the size of their battery bank for solar. Their original one was introduced in 2019, 13 kilowatt hour capacity. They're now coming with a 26 kilowatt hour and a 52 kilowatt hour unit for residential. 52 is pretty big. Um, and fourth quarter, we're still on a battery theme. Today we're on a battery theme. So um, fourth quarter 2021 was the biggest quarter for storage. Uh, yet, actually more storage was installed connected with solar than in the first three quarters of last year. And of this though, about 85% of it was utility scale storage. So 15% residential. Uh, the leading front runners on the storage market, California, Puerto Rico, Texas, and Florida. Not surprisingly, California, wildfires, Puerto Rico, hurricanes, Florida hurricanes, Texas, stupidity. So those are the main <laughs> crises that are uh, causing power outages. And in the past five years, storage on the grid uh, has increased 1,263%. So wow. definitely the, the most recent yeah. trend. Community solar is in the news again. New York is the first state to install one gigawatt of community solar. And actually in 2021 in the state of New York, community solar accounted for 70% of all the solar installed in the state. And uh, they do have a goal in New York. Their, their renewable portfolio standard is now up to 70% renewable by the year 2030. Illinois is doing a little pot pilot project with community solar. Um, they're calling it Give a Ray, which is cute, whatever. Uh, they're giving away free, pot, um, free power to low and moderate income folks through a con community solar project. And it's in uh, Kankakee County. Bob, do you know where Kankakee, I think it's Rockford area, is that right? Up in that area? 
Okay. Um, so that's, but it's only 600 customers. So it's a relatively small pilot program. I'm sure they got some sort of grant or something, but it's, it's interesting. And next tracker has announced a new um, uh, product out there, tracking systems at utility scale for sloped and uneven terrain which is interesting. I know, uh, George, uh, we were talking about farmland being, you know, gobbled up for, um, for these utility scale systems. If you can begin having tracking systems on undulating properties, sloped properties, you know, because right now they're going after those nice, clean, flat um, prairie lands that uh, have easy access and, and access to, uh, to transmission lines. So, so that's the news that I have. Um, we had been talking just before I so rudely interrupted. Oh, I wanted to mention too, I've got um, four links in the chat to some webinars. Uh, the webinars, uh, I attended a couple of webinars this last week. One was on storage. Uh, the link is there for the video of that. It, it was interesting. There was some good information. I found the presenter a little bit annoying at first because he thinks he's very clever. And uh, you know how people who think they're clever are annoying, right? Uh, so, so anyway, um, that, but he did have some good information, got into it and things I didn't know. So that was good. Uh, also a WealthWorks webinar that I attended, that was over a couple of days. The ones I would point you to on that, there were a couple of sessions about utility scale solar. So I found those the most interesting. A lot of those are kind of useless. Um, Solar Edge has a, a webinar coming up and I put posted the link for that. It's actually a four hour training on their um, Solar Edge uh, Energy Hub system. That's their new system that integrates batteries. Um, it also integrates EV charging generators uh, it replaces the old storage system that they used to have. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's, that's in the link as well. And if you want to know about what the Energy Hub is all about, I put a video that explains that system there as well. Okay, so those were the announcements. Um, let's see, what, anybody have any comments before we jump into battery stuff? Jay, I'm just curious, the, the ones you listed, did they say what kind of chemistry or, or the companies that were doing it in, in the Texas, the California and the, uh, the Florida ones? Oh, you mean which, ones... which battery systems are being used primarily? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they didn't say in that article, although I did read a different article about which batteries and at the residential level, of course, the majority of this is going to be utility scale. Right. That's what I was curious. Way outside of my knowledge. Maybe Tony knows what what kind of battery technology is used at, at that level. I'm not sure. Um, Tony, am I putting you on the spot with something you don't know about, or is this in your wheelhouse? Well, uh, I've got, we have, we have the esteemed privilege. My brother is on right now. My younger brother is about to get his PhD. Um, his focus is he's a mechanical engineer, but his focus is on batteries. So I thought I'd have him join this conversation. Um, for grid scale, Dom, you can uh, you can chime in here. One of the interesting things I saw on, on grid scale, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting alchemies out there right now. Uh, iron air is probably the most interesting. It's not commercialized right now. Okay. Right. But I think that's form energy um, that does that. Um, but Tesla has a, a variety of, you know, grid scale uh, packages, and I believe those are LFP. Dom, is that correct? Uh, not right now. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for letting me come in. Um, currently, all stationary storage applications that I'm aware of are still NMT. Um, so very similar chemistry to what goes in the cars. Everyone is planning right. on transitioning to LFP, but that might happen in a little bit. Uh, it's still going to take some time, uh, similar with the iron air. Yeah, What's, the Tesla stuff I saw looked like a whole bunch of car batteries put into giant houses or something, or or, yep, yep, or yeah, that's exactly right. uh, train boxes or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, big modules. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's the advantage of the LFP over the NMC? Uh, cost primarily. Just cost. 
Yeah, yeah. The lithium iron phosphate is substantially cheaper um, and much easier to process than the nickel, cobalt, manganese, uh, aluminum oxides. Do they have the same problem with thermal runaway? Uh, no, they're actually much, much better with thermal runaway. Um, as indicated by the new BYD blade battery, um, they have some phenomenal performance metric, performance metrics and puncture tests. Um, it's really worth checking out because it is quite, uh, it's exciting. It's really exciting to see what, how the, go ahead. Since we've got somebody on here who actually knows about batteries, as opposed to me, um, <laughs> you know, I just got an email from somebody who um, was saying he's got a, a home system in a cabin and he has lithium ion batteries there. Now I've always been told that lithium ion performs better in cold temperatures than lead acid. And he's saying that his charging system actually shuts down at freezing and, um, and is causing him some problems because apparently his system set to, to sort of disconnect the process when it gets below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, lithium ions, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't have a massive operating window in terms of temperature. Um, they like to be in that 60 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit for optimal. Um, they can definitely run down below freezing, but that would just be a problem with the BMS system that he has connected to his battery. Uh, that's preventing that from, from cycling, um, which is, I mean, I don't know what kind of system he has, but uh, that's not uncommon for uh, manufacturers to limit the temperature operating range to that kind of level because you, it won't um, catch fire or anything. You'll just uh, degrade the battery a little bit faster at those temperatures. Well, well there, I, is, there is movement in the NEC, at least I've heard this. I haven't seen it you know, in documentation that they're looking at moving batteries outdoors or outside of the living spaces. And, and that seems to me that's gonna cause some sincere temperature issues with our systems. I mean, if you live in Southern California, everything's fine, but uh, <laughs> right, yeah. for the rest of us in the real world, you know, mm -hmm. we got snow and, and cold temperatures. So do you see that as a, as a potential problem? And are we going to have to have heated cabinets for all of our batteries? Yeah, I mean, you're really getting at the, the difference between um, the regulations and the, the actual people making the products. Um, there is always that, that strenuous relationship between the two. And that in particular is not an impossible problem to solve. I mean, it's similar to what Tesla does in their vehicles. You would just add active heating, um, which would decrease the efficiency that you're getting. Um, and it would de is definitely suboptimal, but um, it, it wouldn't be that hard to engineer around, no. It wouldn't be a massive problem. And Dom, isn't yes. the isn't the issue with the lithium the charging part of it? Because they can operate down to freezing, but it's the charging aspect of it that you want them at freezing or above, correct? Yeah, yeah. Charging is always uh, more problematic than discharging, um, as Anthony knows very well. Um, yeah, so most of the problems that you encounter uh, will be on the charging side, but you can at high uh, discharge rates. It can also be a problem uh, at low temperatures, but uh, that's probably not in the use case for uh, a stationary storage application. Okay. So you got to put your inverter in questions. your battery you. house. That way your inverter is putting off heat to help heat your batteries. And then like you mentioned, put the active, Precisely. active warming in there. Well, right. a lot of these- It may not even be that. entirely necessary, but- Yeah. Well, do you know the reason? I mean, again, I've asked different people and I'll just keep asking until somebody tells me what is their motivation for putting these things outside? Um, you know, it seems to be lead acid batteries may be more problematic being inside than, than lithium ion uh, because of outgassing. And, uh, but they've never, mm -hmm. that's never been an issue with lithium ion, with lead acid. Well, Jay, like we talked about before, um, you know, to me, it seems so ridiculous that you'd have to put a seven or 13 kilowatt hour battery pack outside, but you could park your 200 kilowatt uh, Hummer in your garage. That's fine. Um, but the seven must go outside. Um, that seems like a, like a kind of a ridiculous disconnect. And also it's like, what is outside? Is the garage outside? Um, is it outside? Because like, if, it, if, it, if it goes off, Having it be attached to the exterior of your house doesn't necessarily help anything either. Sure. 
Yeah, and, and if it is a voltage issue or a thermal runaway issue or whatever, who knows? But and and I did see a separate interpretation that it was outside the living area or the occupied area. That well, would make more again, sense. That would make more again, sense. What is what is that? Right. You know, they probably the, were trying to prevent people from, uh, you know, rigging up a bunch of questionable lead acid batteries in their like closet in their you know bedroom uh, <laughs> or their pantry in their kitchen is probably what they're trying to avoid yeah but those people aren't going to worry about what the end <laughs> right. <does> anyway. <laughs> but like, that's that's true with all regulations yeah you, you know right. you, go, you go after the people who, who are most problematic and those are the ones that don't give a shit about your regulation that's right. um, are, are you guys familiar with the orson battery orson like orson yeah. wells uh, Orison. Uh, so it's a, a startup, and uh, they they're you know trying to compete against Tesla and other batteries for uh, storage. But what's different about what they're doing is they have smaller units, and they're really meant to be plugged into a, uh, the wall, like it's right into the circuit, uh, like to power your refrigerator or power lights and things like that in the event of an outage. But these units are in the house, you know, and then they're lithium batteries. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, they don't seem to, or maybe, you know, th this regulation came after, you know, they put out their product. But, but what's neat about this thing is it's, it's meant to be lightweight. It's meant to be just plug in, no installer comes in. Um, and it's uh, able to be used by a renter as opposed to a landowner, you know, or a landlord, you know. Hmm. How are those They're, different than like a, a universal power source kind of thing that they sell at Best Buy? Right. So it's it's like a big you know UPS basically. Um, okay. But uh, it's and they try and make them you know look nice so they have one unit looks like a like a uh, like a lamp and then another unit mounts on the wall <laughs> like a like a like a like a TV like a flat screen. Um, and they have lights on them so that, you know, in the event of an outage, you have a light right there. Mm -hmm. um, you guys should check it out. Um, I was I was trying to see if I could get some information, but they have no customer service. So, <laughs> Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but when we go plug and cord connected, aren't we basically exempt from any and all NEC regulations? I mean, that was there's a company called Legion Solar that is the same idea, but it's solar panels. They've got something that they plug and cord connect and a renter can put them on their apartment and it's there's no permit, no NEC, no inspector because it's all plug and cord connected. You just unplug it and take it with you. And it's just like what you're describing with this battery box. Yeah, I would have to assume that's the case. Otherwise every laptop would be subject to NEC, you know? So, and there's maybe some uh, size, you know, issues there. I don't know. And to bear in mind, this is a, um, proposal. It's not the code just yet. Uh, there's talk that in the, uh, uh, what is it, the 2023 code uh, is when this is going to go into effect, which should be coming out here in August of this year, I think. So, but I haven't seen any draft um, wording on it. It's only that I've been hearing about it in, in the press and in webinars and things of that nature, but I haven't seen any proposed, you know, verbiage as to what that means. Is that any and all battery types that you've been hearing them refer to, or is it particularly lithium? Uh, again, it's always, well, when they when I see these webinars, it's always about lithium because yeah. nobody wants to talk about lead acid anymore. It's sort of old technology. But uh, you know, the only justification I have in my own mind as to why this is coming up now is because they did remove that provision of the 50 volt limitation um, if it was considered inaccessible, you know, well, they, they made it unlimited. So if you're talking about the potential of putting a 5,000 volt battery system or whatever, you know, since there is no limitation, maybe they decided, okay, that, that could be potentially dangerous for whatever reason. I don't know why it would be more dangerous than a 50 volt, but you know, these guys, who knows, um, they're, um, you know, maybe that's their motivation. I, I, I don't know, because thermal runaway doesn't seem like a legitimate issue. Those things happen, but they're very rare and they require some sort of physical um, damage to it. 
you know, so uh, not really sure. Hopefully we'll get, we'll stay tuned on that. Anybody else have anything else they want to bring up? Yeah, Eric? I think, I think, that, I think that's it, Maya. That's kind of about the um, battery storage not being connected to any renewable like solar being exempted in code because in Trinidad and Tobago, once they remove the PV side to the <laughs> connected to the battery, they classify it as some kind of EPS system and they don't really have to go through the inspection. It's one of those little um, books in Trinidad that we looked at. Mm. Okay, Eric, you had something? Yeah, two things. Um, we have a Pacifica hybrid at the park we just got, and we just got a recall on it saying they are not to be parked inside a garage. Ah. And it's, it's uh, evidently there's a problem with the battery. It's a thermal thing, but it seems a, that would be a tough thing to sell a vehicle that you can't park in a garage. <laughs> and the second thing is, I uh, was curious if anybody has heard about the sodium ion batteries and if they're actually gonna gain traction. With yeah, um, I haven't done a real deep dive into them, but they seem to show promising results. CATL, which is uh, currently the king of LFP, they've been primarily driving. They're they're focused on driving down the cost of uh, batteries for stationary storage applications. And from the performance metrics that I've seen, it does seem like um, that might be the primary use case for them, at least in the near future. Um, but again, I mean, in, in this world, it's, it takes years and years to set up these manufacturing systems. So even even short term, you're talking maybe three or four years, they start to get traction. Um, that being said, there's a big asterisk next to that because CATL is absolutely a powerhouse um, in this space. And they've been able to get a lot of things done really, really quickly. So Right, right. Yeah, there's. Yeah, there's lots of claims, um, and you kind of have to just wait, sit back and wait and see um, if they can actually walk the walk. But yeah, it is exciting for sure. It would definitely take some uh, strain off of the lithium supply chain, which would be nice. I, I have a question. Um, those utility scale systems that incorporate energy storage system, what, what is it, um, the voltage range they normally use for those type of battery storage? It's something I was wondering to know. Yeah, so what, what's that's the a great question. For utility? Yeah. Um, I'm sure it would be dependent upon the application, um, obviously dependent upon uh, what it's hooked up to. I know that the like one of the very first mega projects, the, the Hornsdale Mega Pack is connected to a wind farm. Um, so that would require a different voltage, uh, a different voltage range than something if it was hooked up to like a mega solar project which would be different than if it was just exclusively stationary storage. Um, so that'll be entirely dependent upon the locality, what it's connected to, the distribution of it, you know, to the, the residents. Um, so I'm sure there'd be a wide, wide range, but that is a good question. I should look more into that. Well, and maybe this is outside of your range, but are you seeing our uh, utility scale batteries being a lithium type battery, or are we seeing flow batteries being integrated into the utility scale? Um, world. Um, yeah, flow batteries. I, I've always liked flow batteries because um, I just think they're kind of cool. Uh, but they don't, they haven't seemed to pick up a lot of traction at all. Um, and there is going to be a, a, a winner take most scenario, I believe, um, where all of this research and development is going to lithium ion batteries. I'm personally working in the recycling space for them where there's a lot of work being done that's gonna drive the cost down even further. Um, it, it's gonna be hard to beat lithium ion. That's uh, that's the best I can say. I don't, I don't wanna speak too broadly because uh, I don't know too much about flow batteries or sodium ion, but it does seem like lithium uh, will be the winner long term, at least the, the market domination. Okay. So Jay, the sodium ion, is that what you call salt water battery? Mm, I don't think so. I think that's a different thing. Um, the salt water batteries that I've seen developed through Aquion um, are residential scale primarily. Uh, I don't know. Has there been any movement in that same technology, um, Dominic, uh, about uh, salt water battery technology at the yeah, okay. yeah. There's there's uh, I actually just read an article about it. Um, 
that was singing its praises. But again, I, it's, it's very, very difficult to know. It's easy to do things on a small scale. It's very, very difficult to do things on that size of a scale. One of the benefits that lithium ion batteries have that was uh, also determined in that Hornsdale Mega Pack is the ability for it to, to switch on and off, to accept and, and give energy back to the grid. Um, massively important. They actually do it faster than the grid itself can, uh, can measure it. Um, so they owe Tesla a bunch of money, but uh, it's, it's very, very difficult use cases. This is a, obviously lithium ion batteries are planning to take a massive swath of the market of the energy market, ranging from transportation to stationary storage, you know, to grid applications. I mean, and uh, in every single one of those use cases, there's an infinite number of use cases between those two um, where any individual competitor could, could carve out a niche for itself. Um, but in terms of what as an individual technology dominating the broad swath of energy, I, it's hard to believe that uh, anything is going to compete with lithium ion on that scale. Well, we've always heard, or I've always heard that, um, lithium ion was going to be a transition technology. Um, but it sounds like your kind of perspective is, Hey, it's here to stay for the, for the medium term anyway. Yeah, yeah, medium term, I would say. I'd say that's that's accurate. Um, obviously, people love hydrogen, um, which I can't understand myself. But uh, long term, that seems like a viable option. Um, it does have much higher energy density than lithium, but um, yeah, uh, it does it does seem like that that it will be here to stay. I mean, it's a great it's a great solution. Uh, you see the impact that it has on people's lives. How much people love electric vehicles. Energy independence is a massive thing, obviously. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it'll impact people's lives greatly, um, which is why I'm excited to be in the field. Yeah, I know you, um, I'm glad to hear that you don't like hydrogen. <laughs> one of my personal pet peeves, but I, I, I have kind of modified yeah. my perspective slightly on hydrogen in that I think there might mm. be a role for it to play in some heavy industrial applications that are using um, what might otherwise be curtailed renewable energy sources like wind farms or, or solar that would not have a demand for their power that they could produce. So basically we're talking free energy to then produce hydrogen mm. for some sort of localized at point of production industrial scale application. Uh, so you don't have storage and transport issues and things like that, but, but it might, and, and I'm not quite sure, but it, I heard something that it could be transferred into a liquefied, almost like a, a take hydrogen and make it a liquid form, uh, which would be something yeah. that yeah. could be- Isn't that very energy intensive though? I mean, hydrogen yeah. has to go down way, 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 way down. Sure, yeah, but, but this, what I'm saying, if the energy is free and abundant and otherwise would simply have been turned off, or curtailed, mm -hmm. well, then maybe it makes economic sense. But other than that, the energy out is usually going to be more than the energy in, um, you know, for hydrogen. So right. it just doesn't make sense. So yeah, that's a great example of one of those niches, you know, that batteries won't be able to touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were talking in some article I read, I think, about using it to make a liquid uh, air airplane fuel of some sort, because the energy mm -hmm. density required in an airplane is so high that that you know electric may never be a, a viable I, option because of the weight. I'd be a little nervous about being in a, an airplane with the liquid hydrogen fuel. I mean, that's it's like a, more like a rocket. Yeah, it's like well, the Hindenburg. <laughs> You guys, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, gasoline explodes. <laughs> you know? it's, it's like when, when we have people come to our place and they say- It, it doesn't expand a thousand times though, or whatever the type of shit. <laughs> well, it, it just reminds me when people come to our house and our house is made out of automobile tires primarily, and people say, don't tires catch on fire? Isn't that dangerous? And I say, well, now what's your house made out of? It's wood. Wood. <laughs> like now doesn't wood catch on fire you know so, so it's like let's be realistic okay all right any you other don't forget comments? the vinyl and the foam and yeah. everything <laughs> <laughs> yeah my house is made out of volatile organic compounds you know? so all right well let me dance into the um battery thing here because the article i was reading was comparing pricing 
for residential battery systems and the ones that are out there in the market that are dominating. And of course, the, the primary battery packs that are out there are Tesla, um, Generac, uh, LG Chem, Enphase, and um, it's not really a battery pack, but the storage or the, the, the um, solar edge system. So I, I was wanting to find out, well, what do these things cost? Because we've had discussions in the past, you know, they keep saying the cost of lithium ion keeps coming down and it's below a hundred hundred dollars per uh, kilowatt, um, you know, or approaching that, and that's a watershed moment. Well, you're never going to find a battery out there that you can buy for a hundred dollars a kilowatt. So, so what do these things really cost? Plus, measuring in kilowatts, to my mind anyway, never makes sense from a consumer perspective. Little bit of sense, but it's more you're trying to deal with it from a storage perspective, as opposed to a a peak load perspective. So, so we're really kind of talking about kilowatt hours as opposed to kilowatts of, of output. And so, so I know that the kilowatts is important, but then my brain keeps dismissing it because I keep going, yeah, they're going to give me enough to run whatever loads I'm going to run. So I just need to know how long I can run them. And, and that's where I'm coming from. So Tesla, Tesla Powerwall, of course, is the big gun out there. Um, and, and I'm actually going to do a podcast radio program. Our next one is, is on why Tesla seems to screw up everything they get involved with. So, so that'll be an interesting, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll anger a number of people who love Tesla, but uh, I'm mad at them because I signed up for the Starlink program and it's been two years and they still haven't come and set it up. And now they sent me a notice saying they're doubling the cost. Um, you should have moved to Ukraine, Jay. You, they yeah, should have moved you to Ukraine. That's right. Exactly. So, so anyway, so I'm mad at Elon Musk, so I'm taking him down. So anyway, uh, the Tesla Powerwall, a uh, standalone cost of the Tesla Powerwall is about 8,500 bucks, according to articles I've seen. Although you can't really buy them. Um, you know, they're kind of, hard to get, which is one thing, but now they've said you can't buy them unless you buy them as part of a Tesla system. So it sounds like you gotta buy the whole package from Tesla before you can get a power wall, um, which you know might be fine for them, but it's not really fine if you're just wanting to add a Tesla power wall to your existing system or whatever. And the 8,500- for antitrust, Jay. Pardon? Soon for antitrust. Yeah. <laughs> for bundling, like you oh. know, Windows in the old days. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that's so. Uh, anyway, the um, the system, the, there's about two grand in install and brackets and things like that. So even though the battery system is going to be 8,500, it's about 10,500. And this is for a 13.5 um, kilowatt hour system. So you're going to find that's considered the lowest cost of all of the battery options that are out there, the main ones. So uh, Generac is another one. Uh, now they um, will sell you either a 9 kW or 9 kilowatt hour or an 18 kilowatt hour system. Respectively, it's going to be about $10,000 for the 9 kilowatt hour or 18,000 for the 18 kilowatt hour. So the price number that I keep coming to is about $1,000 a kilowatt hour of, of storage. That's where all these systems keep coming down. Now with Generac, you can keep adding um, three kilowatt hour batteries to it, you know, but, but it's, you gotta have the base system first. Uh, it's a DC coupled system Whereas, of course, Tesla Powerwall is an AC coupled system. Uh, LG Chem, LG Chem is the other one, but that's just a battery. Um, you know, that is not the, the inverter, um, you know, the battery based inverter integrated in. I know Tesla Powerwall in, integrates their, their inverter, and I'm assuming, uh, but I couldn't find it directly, but I'm pretty sure Generac does as well in their, in their nine kilowatt hour system. 
End phase. Nope. Pardon? You have any cost there for um, Fortress Power? For just the power? Fortress Power, the company for the um, the, 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 the lithium ion systems. I didn't catch the name of it. What is that? Fort, Fort, Fortress Power. Fortress Power? I'm not familiar Fort, with that. Fortress Power. Fortress. 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 Fortress Power. Oh, Fortress. Yes. No, I didn't. I didn't put them down. There were some other ones, like uh, some one called Big Battery. But these were the main selling. You know, I just picked the the ones that were the biggest market share. So, um, uh, the LG LG Chem. I'll run through them, but then we can talk about uh, specifics on it. LG Chem. There's a 9.6 kilowatt hour and a 16 kilowatt hour. 9,000 and 12,000 respectively on those. Enphase, Enphase was considered one of the more expensive. It's got a 3.3 3 really kilowatt hour battery for $3,000, uh, 10 kilowatt hour for uh, $9,000. With that, however, you're gonna need a transfer switch, which is about 2,000 bucks, and a load controller if you want to control your loads for $500. Um, a lot of these do include uh, or do not include the transfer switches. So like with the Generac system, a transfer switch was going to be 2,300 bucks. And, and in case you're wondering, transfer switch is what disconnects you from the grid when you go into standalone mode, essentially. So these are there for, for when the grid goes down. So you got to disconnect from the grid for anti-islanding. So you're going to have another couple thousand dollars to set that up unless, and I've talked to some people want to do it manually or whatever, your local inspector may or may not be happy with that. Chances are probably not, but, um, and then the, the last one that I looked at was the Solar Edge Energy Hub. And this is kind of an interesting um, item. It's fairly new out there, but it's basically replacing their store edge they used to have storage that integrated uh, the ability to use um, uh, battery backup, but they discontinued that. And for a while, they did not have a battery uh, option. Well, this uh, energy hub is a D DC coupled system. It looks like the cost of it adds about $1,000 to the cost of the inverter for just a regular non-battery capable inverter. Uh, but it and it integrates in with their power optimizer system and everything. Um, but it also integrates EV charging as part of that, which they claim it sounds to me anyway, the big EV charging um, value is you could charge your electric vehicle when the grid is down by being connected to this. Why you would want to do that? I don't know, unless you got a heck of a big system you know, a, a big solar array, uh, or you're not using power anywhere else, I guess you're using your, your car as a battery storage device or whatever. Um, and you can also integrate a generator through this um, module, which, which is a thing we've talked about in past sessions where that's good that, that it's controlling the generator because that way you're not gonna back feed the batteries um, or, uh, or the inverter you know, and damage the inverter if the generator is running. So it builds that in and it does have an integrated transfer switch. It's a true um, bimodal inverter. So, so everything is hooking into the inverter unit. The battery backup is, the generator, the EV charging station um, is all integrated. However, this system only works with the LG Chem battery bank. So that is the only model of battery that it's currently um, specced out to integrate with. So I guess we could throw LG Chem and Solar Edge as a package together. So all these things still come out to about a little more or a little less than $1,000 a kilowatt hour of, of storage capacity. Hey, Jay, um, pardon yeah. my ignorance. Uh, I'm not familiar with the Tesla stuff. And you said it was AC coupled where all these others are DC coupled. Is that just referring to what the batteries are actually getting? Well, and, and I didn't, um, end phase is also an AC coupled system. So mm -hmm. the difference between the AC coupled and the DC coupled 
is the system is designed to take AC power. So, so it actually has an inverter charger um, where it takes power that's already been converted to AC, transfers it into DC or charges the, the battery bank, and then inverts that DC power into AC for use at the load. So, so it's always was, it was always assumed before that AC coupled was kind of an impractical approach because you're taking DC power from the array, converting it to AC, then taking the AC power, converting it to DC, and then taking the DC and converting it to AC again. So it's going through three transfers and each one loses efficiency, but the right. efficiency of these systems are getting pretty good. So, so it becomes somewhat practical, although the guys who, who offered the DC coupled systems like, like SolarEdge would say, it doesn't make a heck of a lot more sense to take the DC power from the array, charge a DC battery, and then only do that conversion one time. And you're going to get better efficiency out of your system. Um, in, the advantage in your knowledge, of the, yeah. would you say that's because of the microinverters? Because microinverters have become so ubiquitous that we're making the AC off the array, and so it makes sense that way. Because well, in the residential market, yes, because uh, the microinverter end phase has about fifty percent of the residential uh, market share. So if you've got a system or want to put in microinverters, you're going to have to have an AC coupled system. And so right. Enphase has created their own in, in a package. But um, there's also those people who have existing PV systems and now they want to put in battery storage. Well, they don't want to scrap what they've already got and it's already outputting AC current. So you just add a DC coupled system or an AC coupled system like a Tesla to that and fine and dandy. Although Tesla is now saying, hey, we don't want you to do that. We want you to right. buy all of our crap. And, and so, you know, that becomes somewhat difficult or problematic. And, and it seems to be a move in this DCAC coupled world that people are putting together, you know, compatible packages. It's not a mix and match anymore. You buy an Enphase system or you buy a Tesla system or you buy a Solar Edge system, which makes things easier for the installer for sure. Um, and certainly for warranties and things like that. So, right. any comments on this? I was just looking at something. Um, gee, I was reaching out to um, grow out on the um, battery system. Um, I just, there's a flyer by the center mayor on the sub distributor price. <laughs> Uh, 2.56 kilowatt hour, lithium iron phosphate. And this is our sub distributor price at seven hundred and sixty dollars US. Seven hundred and sixty, did you say? Yes. Okay, let's buy them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know that the. I mean, you said this is your distributor price. Um, yeah, well, they come out from China. Well, I think that was from the oh, um, Chinese. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Tony, you, you're you in the world of, of buying batteries. I mean, yeah. When I, I spoke with CATL, they were actually um, annoyingly easy to get a hold of. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't you talk to anyone in the United States, but the, the largest battery manufacturer in the world will pick up the phone or, or, or spy them to an email within 24 hours. They actually said that their price would be sub $200 a kilowatt hour for me, little old me. Um, and then obviously a, a reduction at scale, right? So now sure, part of their calculus is that this is gonna be way more than a one-off, um, you know, not just for my house and then I'll say, see you later. Uh, but I suppose you could, uh, you could get a, you know, a, a, a demo or whatever and then, and then rock and roll from there. But from the mothership themselves, from CATL themselves, uh, sub $200 a kilowatt hour um, and then probably down to 100, uh, or less at scale. Nice BYD. Yeah, BYD. Well, the blade, like Don was talking about, BYD is, you know, <laughs> sub 100, right? Or, or you know, yeah, right around there. <laughs> I try to contact them to get some price and answer got to give us something, but they're not reaching back. <laughs> yeah, BYD is a little harder to get a hold of. Uh, <laughs> but but they're also doing some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. yeah so I think it's like, you know, uh, the early adopters don't really know what's going on. And there's a, I think people realize that 
there's a huge demand for this and the supply isn't there. So just jack up the prices 10 X for what you're, what you're getting them for or five X of what you're getting them for. And then, you know, this is also a, we're in a transition period. And as Dom said that these take, you know, battery manufacturing facilities take an awfully long time to stand up. So we won't be here in five years. Um, but I think people are just going to try to make money hand over fist until then. So it sounds like, I mean, a lot of these systems like the Tesla or the Enphase integrate in their battery uh, with their inverter chargers. Yeah. Um, and, and, but I know the Enphase simply uses four um, microinverters in there with, with their battery bank. So I, knowing that those things cost about 150 bucks a piece, so that's six hundred dollars of it. So the other um, twenty four hundred bucks is basically just a battery. And and if you're saying we, you know, people are going to be selling them to distributors at around two hundred dollars, and they're selling them three three kilowatt hour for about they're currently selling about eight hundred dollars. Um, there's a lot of room for the prices to come down. Sounds sure. Like. Yeah. So I guess one of the questions I would have there is if I'm installing a solar edge system right now and I go, okay, I want to install this uh, energy hub inverter. Uh, it's going to cost me an extra thousand dollars right now. I'm not going to put the batteries in because I think batteries are going to come down dramatically, but will the battery technology change to the point where the, when it comes down, it's not going to be compatible with this system that I've just installed, you know, are these things going to be backwardly compatible, or are we going to see that I I was I made a mistake getting it ready? Yeah, I think um, both options are on the table right now. I think uh, the chemistry matters a little less than, like you can you can make the you can make everything kind of fit together pretty nicely by by the operating you know, current voltage uh, in the BMS system, right? So regardless of like, you make your batteries out of vibranium in five years or whatever, right? Whatever cool alchemy there is, uh, you still should be able to do the handshake uh, with the system at a certain operating voltage, right? Um, that's how like we're designing our system right now mm -hmm. um, for a nominal 400 volts. So we don't really give a shit what the battery is made out of as long as it can kind of go between that 350 and 450, 500. Um, my assumption is that, that that kind of mentality will continue. Now, I think it's also interesting because we kind of came to the similar conclusion that all of these guys are, which is, it makes sense to put these things together. Um, one for a, uh, like a, a profitability perspective, you can now you can now eat all of that margin um, that's out there right now on the battery side. But also, it, you know, when we did an internal assessment, you know, our original idea was like, hey, we'll be compatible with any with whatever battery you want to put in there as long as it operates on you know the 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 nominal voltage. And what we found was like, people don't want that. People don't want like, you don't, you don't sell your iPhone and then like you can pick between three different batteries. They just give me a, give me the iPhone, right? Like make it work. So people just want turnkey solutions and they're not, um, I, we're, we're, we're emerging from like the, the scrappy piratey uh, kind of off grid to more of like, this is a little bit spit and polished and, and kind of, I want turnkey solutions for everything. Sure. So it's a hell of a lot easier for the developer of whatever power electronics to just pick a horse and then write it and do all the technical deconfliction with them and offer it in a bundle pack. It just simplifies everything from like our perspective. And I think ultimately it makes a, a way more predictable and easy user experience because it's not like, well, here's this thing, figure it out. And then like, you're having to figure out like, did I buy this right battery? Does this go with this? That's not, that's not super cool if you care about adoption. Sure. I wonder if when you were saying that it occurred to me, maybe that's why the Solar Edge system or the Energy Hub system only works with LG Chem. Is that yeah. that's the only battery out there that's voltage-wise compatible? Because because Solar uh, Solar Edge requires fixed voltage um, from the solar panels, and I wonder if that battery bank is operating at that 400 volt range, 
that those solar panels are because most of them out there that you buy are 48 volt, um, you know, that you see advertised. But I don't know what LG Chem's battery voltage is. Yeah, so we optimized ours for for EVs, um, you know, typical EV uh, usage. And uh, there's other, I mean, CATL is a perfect example. They're like, yeah, well, tell me what you want and we'll, we'll, we can build it for you. I think the other thing to kind of remember is also like it might have not, nothing to do with the tech specs and it might just simply have to do with they needed to pick a reliable battery partner and they picked LG and then in their contract, they said they will only use LG batteries, period. Then there it is. It has nothing to do with, you know, nominal or operating voltages or anything else. It is simply a matter of like, you said this, you do this. And we're the only way we pen this agreement and help you with the technical deconfliction is if you only sell our batteries. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it may be warranty issues as well. You know, exactly. We trust, yeah. We Everything's easier when you, when you put it together in, in one, in one roof. Yeah. Cause then you have to, you don't have to determine like, Oh, I sell, sold you this, but you paired it with a BYD battery or a CATL battery. And is it the BMS that was the problem or is my system the problem? You sell as a one power tower and then it kind of simplifies a lot of things. Well, is there any motion out there in the battery world um, setting industry standards? You know, it sounds like it's if if solar is the Wild West, this is uh, what uh, trappers entering the wilderness, you know, I mean, in batteries here. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe Dom can speak a little bit more of, of what you're seeing kind of from your from your vantage point. Um, I, I mean, I think we're. <laughs> Solar is pretty tame compared to compared to the storage scene right now. Um, what was what I would encourage everyone to do if you've got the time and it was good for my mental health is to read like the story of the early grid because you realize like this type of chaos is not new. Mm -hmm. um, you know when you had just a fist fight over everything on not, not how energy and who was able to make it, how it was distributed, right? All of that was complete complete anarchy um and that's where we're at i think right now on the on the battery front i think the solar space is relatively tame right now uh, certainly way more standardized way more white glove and tame than the battery space is right now okay i know uh, eric's holding up a really great book um that uh, somebody wrote <laughs> called when the biomass hits the wind turbine available for free on our website if you want to pick up a copy so uh-huh <laughs> so dom are you yeah. dom are you seeing anything on the standardization side uh yeah you pretty much hit the nail on the head um i love batteries because they're so incredibly complex on the inside but all of that complexity emerges just to an incredibly simple positive and negative terminal on the outside and that's all you need that's all you need to know obviously some thought has to be given to the operating voltage um but that is entirely determined by the BMS system, um, which is which is you know easily codable. Um, so yes, they will be backwards compatible. Um, but I, I really don't see a way that they're not because anything that's an energy storage device, any electrochemical system, will always just need to have positive and negative terminals, um, which I think is is super awesome. You don't need to understand anything about the inside of the battery. All you need to know is positive or negative the operating voltage, um, and then the, the current that it's capable of withstanding. So yeah, it's, it's pretty, sta it's standardized in that way, but. Well, that's, that's helpful because I'm, uh, you know, when I get people wanting recommendations or spec out a, a system to say that maybe the solar edge system with this energy hub is a good option because it's giving you all of this flexibility in the future and the future being the next five years, let's say. Um, right. You know, right. Then, then we've got that option out there, and it only costs them an extra thousand bucks to uh, to get that flexibility, which seems reasonable. Yeah. Right. Any, yep. Anybody else have anything to add? We're coming up on on well, our. I can throw our... a chaos grenade. I can throw a chaos grenade in the last five minutes that we have to just kind okay. of like maybe keep in the back of all of our minds is um, adding to this anarchy of storage is v to x vehicle to whatever oh yeah um right so like when we're talking about a thousand dollars a kilowatt hour for a stationary storage battery and then the f-150 lightning comes on next year watch yeah. out world like we're gonna get things are gonna get weird real quick um dom and i have had some awesome conversations about uh you you wouldn't build a stationary storage battery 
uh, the same way you'd build a battery if you knew it was going in an electric vehicle. But if you don't plan on living completely off grid and you're really only using a battery system for the, you know, when the, when the, when the biomass hits the wind turbine, um, then I think potentially a more interesting conversation is uh, solar plus bi-directional charger plus AC connection. Um, that's how we, that's what we saw earlier on. We kind of, we were developing this before storage was like a, was so hot. And we thought, well, maybe the best is to just do solar plus car plus home or whatever entity grid. Um, just going to throw that out there as like uh, something else that, you know, just complicates this whole wild world we live in is stationary storage for home lab application uh, will we'll certainly continue to go gangbusters, right? But there's also this, this, just keep in mind, no one's like, there's no cigar smoke filled room where someone like a bunch of people have it all figured out and they're plotting this. It's complete madness. I'm here to tell you, reporting back from the front that it's complete mad and utter madness. And I think there's, there's a version of this, of the world where um, the stationary storage for home applications is a fad um, and it goes right to V to G. Um, the whole V or V to G is a little bit, I think a little bit more of like a pipe dream. It's super complex to figure out like, well, we're going to use cars and we're going to store grid power on them. Nah, probably not. But V to H probably. Um, what about what about V to MG uh, microgrid? It, yeah, uh, v to, well, V to MG or you know V to V is something that you know we we're developing right now. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't use the second DC port for a for a battery, you can use it as another charging cable, so you can charge an EV with another EV, right? Like that's a that's another way that you could do you know oh, some kind of like you're gonna plug it into other people's kind of cars cool. yeah 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 <laughs> so yeah it's like a blood transfusion. <laughs> yeah yeah there's i mean there's you know there's the like the army like when we pitched this to the army they were pretty interested in that application specifically right because you to cross level uh and cross load energy like you do ammo or water or anything mm -hmm. else um you know again it's like you, there's no silver bullet to all solutions in all all places and times but the V to X, which is why it's just like ah, vehicle to anything, because we can't like the, the applications for this could be, you know, probably something that we haven't imagined right now. Right. But vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to home, vehicle to grid, vehicle to micro grid. Right. These are all these are all the kind of the wild future that we get to have a have a front row seat uh, in living in. What are you talking to What are you Sorry. What are you talking It's a good lighting and it's getting hooked up to my house grid. Because I already have a solar array, life is good. That's the plan. Yeah. Do you already have it ordered? Not pre-ordered. I'm still talking the wife into it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, so, yeah. Uh, getting access to these things, it's early days. And so getting one is going to be a little bit of a challenge, likely. Yeah, they, they cut off the pre-ordering even about two months, three months ago before I got to it. Yeah. Uh, There'll uh, be other players. I, I, I spoke with... Uh, some guys at Rivian, um, they're, they're, you know, also pretty cool. I mean, obviously a little bit more pricey, mm -hmm. um, but this is like, this is going to be the thing, right? We're going to look back on this in, in, in five or 10 years. And like, you know, it's like the early us nerds, like the early internet pioneer days, right? We're like, we think the internet's going to be a thing. I just sent Jay a picture on the internet. Isn't this cool? Like that's what we're going to look back on all of this and kind of laugh uh, because it'll be, a, it'll be a wild world that we live in. There'll be a consolidation which is what always happens. It's what happened with the, you know, grid 1.0. Mm -hmm. It's what happened with, uh, you know, the dot-com boom and bust. There'll be, everybody wants to do everything and then there'll be winners and a consolidation and that will, there'll be a lot more standardization and then everyone will go about their lives like this is the, the way it's always been done. Well, I always like to say we're in the floppy disk age of solar. So we're, uh, we're in that mode. And I know Ben, you had brought up the thing. I'm going to cut us off here right now for at the hour, but you had brought up about standalone systems. So maybe um, next Tuesday we'll uh, we'll focus on standalone systems and uh, how that works. I know uh, Don, you've got some input on that uh, from your experience. So I'll try and do some research as to what's out there, what are what are the current issues. So, Thanks. George, did you have a quick question? Uh, well, I'd like to introduce a, a Chris Rock moment at the end here. Our local planning and zoning has introduced a an amendment to their regulations as being 
submitted to fiscal court today. And in those regulations, this sentence is found. Roof mounted systems shall not extend higher than the eave of the existing roof line. They so can't no. anyway, can they? The eave, the eave, isn't that the roof line? Isn't that the beginning of the roof? I, yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> Surely they mean the, the pit, the, the, the tip the of the peak. roof. Right? The peak. Yeah. Not, yeah. Apparently not the uh, gentleman who is the director of the uh, planning and zoning because I pen I pointed it out to him and he just didn't seem to register. <laughs> okay, good, good. Need some good. roof anatomy lessons to even converse about the roof solar then. <laughs> you all are you all are talking about this really high powered stuff and I have to deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. On that note, let's let's call it. Thanks for the good discussion. And, hey, Jay, and we'll... one more thing. Um, yeah. At the very beginning, you mentioned some links in the chat, and they were not there. So I wondered if you could either put those in an email and blast them out, or throw them in the chat, or however you want to do it. I'm um, just going to point that out. Only the people who were on before you put them on there would would see them, Jay. Yeah, I just put them in again, so uh, they should have just appeared there. So, I put in a chat too about uh, NEC changes. I looked through that list and I only saw three that even mentioned EV and nothing about uh, batteries being outside. But we can take a look at it. Okay, great. For some reason, that chat is not updating with any new information from you, Jay. No. Didn't? The last one in there is Bruce Huber. All right. Even when you scroll down, because I, I mean, I can. Yeah, you, yeah. you responded to me personally because I had written to you, so it only came oh, to okay. me. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I see. So, yeah, it said to Lynn. Okay, here's everybody, and I'll put it in there again. Great, and thank you all for a wonderful conversation. I enjoy it when I can attend, and I'm off to Arizona tomorrow, so hopefully I will see lots of solar, or Perfect. not. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'll give it just a minute so you can download. Uh, can anybody... Uh, but we'll call it a day. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Jake. Hey, Jake. See ya. All right. Bye. -bye. Were you able to grab that, Ben? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I'll end Thank it. Thank you. Take care. Take care.